Right, so I am going to talk a little bit about uh, missing maps. Um, it's uh, basically a humanitarian, it started as a humanitarian project and still is with a, a group of people that got together and decided to map out areas and get data to help with disasters. So as you know, when disasters strike, it's not the time to start coordinating thousands of volunteers. And so basically this project was created to get a head start in areas that are not mapped, that are remote, where we're having projects and places that are most likely to get disasters so we can be ahead of the game. So. Essentially, um, the whole aim of, of this project was to put the world's most vulnerable people on the map. Um, and we started with four people, so it was American Red Cross, British Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, and the Humanitarian Open Street Map um, nonprofit. And basically, that's where we started from, um, and we had an outline of where we would go. And last year, I did a talk on where we were eight months after we started. Um, so now, almost two years into the project, um, kind of wanted to give you an update and show you where we are. We've uh, added new members as well. So we now have Cato NG, the Netherlands Red Cross has signed up, uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, and Heidelberg University. And basically everyone who signs on agrees to kind of stick with the same thing of being open, respectful, and building capacity in these areas. So it, it is a really nice group that chats um, almost every two weeks and we communicate over Trello and Slack um, you know, to make sure that we're all sticking to the same ethics and goals of um, getting the world mapped. So we have so far, since we launched in November 2014, have had 275 mapathons in 33 countries, um, 11,800 contributors, 23 million edits to OSM. We've had we've mapped 20 million people, and my favorite statistic is we've had roughly 19,320. Uh, slices of pizza. Don't worry, it's no one's job to count pizza slices. This is a rough estimate based on how many people have attended Mapathons. Um, so basically, um, in the next day or two, you're going to hear other talks about the tech pieces that went into Missing Maps and the really cool innovations that they did, basically to help us work in areas where, they are, where there is no Wi-Fi and there is no power. Um, so my talk is mainly going to be focused on the people aspect of it and how we've been able to grow really big and work with different groups. Um, and it's really about building community. So when you look at statistics like that, it seems almost impossible when you think about only maybe two people, two and a half people were full time on this project. So it's, it's a lot to get done in a really short time. But it mostly was because of the success of these different partnerships, so reaching out. And you can see at every stage of this project, which is the remote tracing, so having mapathon parties in different places, um, to community mapping, which is going into country and then adding that local data of street addresses and points of interest, and then eventually using the data. And at every stage, um, we work with different partners, and that's how things get moving, and you reach a wider network, and you get better data, um, and you learn things you haven't learned before, right? Because OSM has been around for a long time, but it's, you know, there's a lot of new things happening, and it always helps to have people who have done something similar, where you can, like, learn lessons uh, from them and move forward and make your own mistakes and learn from them, too, which is really cool, because um, that's the only way to kind of move forward. So um, as far as building community through remote tracing, we have a few examples of what we've done in the past year. Um, and the very first uh, people or group that we reached out to was universities and colleges. Um, so this is kind of an easy target for us. There's a, um, GW, which is right around the corner from us, and then eventually George Mason had student groups that were already doing geography and learning a little bit about OSM and wanted to do something and students love to volunteer, and they need volunteer hours, and so it worked out really cool. Um, it ended up being something fun, and we started off what was called a map off between two schools, and very quickly it grew to a point where we had schools from different states reach out to us, and we realized that it you know, it wasn't as feasible to talk through, um, you know, every school or every organization had to host a mapathon, and so we started creating materials to basically package it out so we could, you know, have remote mapathons but still stick to the theme and the quality and the training in OSM. So our website 
uh, we, ended, we ended up adding a lot of data of basically how to, you know, e even plan a mapathon. So thinking about Wi-Fi, that was a huge issue for us. You know, a lot of people are like, we have great Wi-Fi, but when you have 20 people and it crashes and you have this huge event planned, it's kind of a problem. Um, so just simple things like that. And there were different events ranging from like five people meeting in a coffee shop to like 100 students. Um, what was really cool was being able to reach out to the OSM people that we knew in those states to have them attend that. So we kind of joined different communities together um, in different places. So for example, um, and this is basically one of our swag boxes. We um, basically had over um, OSM Geo Week, which was last November, was also our one year anniversary. And we had 83 different schools um, sign up to have mapathons. And so we decided to send them like mapathon care packages with like lots of cool gifts and um, training materials and stuff like that, which would make their events a lot more fun. Um, this is at Columbia University. Um, they actually had two different groups that were from different schools. So the School of Geography and I think School of Public Affairs, they didn't even know they were on the same campus and were super interested. So they got connected and were able to have a really cool mapathon. And I think they were, so one of them was also working with humanitarian open street maps. So lots of different worlds colliding, which is really cool. Um, and then there's mapathons all over in different countries. So we have local ones, but also uh, the international community. So this was in Bali, also during OSM Geo Week, um, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where Humanitarian Open Street Map is working. This was the Digital Humanitarians Group in Lahore, Pakistan. Um, I'm not going to say that name uh, because I don't know how to pronounce it, but there was one in Netherlands. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, cool. So we also, that's awesome. We also have a lot of um, local mapping groups, um, which is really cool. In fact, uh, Chase, who was one of the organizing members for this conference, um, basically just randomly heard of Missing Maps, and he's been an OSM contributor for a really long time, and ended up going to this event and was super helpful because he was able to help with new questions and training, which was really awesome, and eventually ended up being like one of the coordinators that runs these mapathons. But it, it, bringing those two groups together gave this project momentum, and it allowed this continuity, so every month they could meet up and uh, you know, meet new people, but they also have access to this great like OSM community that has a lot of information. So that was also something really cool. Um, we also have a lot of Red Cross chapters, um, which is really nice. So being part of the Red Cross is cool because there's are basically everywhere. Um, so there's one in LA, the Orlando chapter also has one, Chicago, um, and it's also growing. So we try as much as possible if we do know uh, some communities in those locations to attend those mapathons because it, it works for everybody and it's super cool. Um, plus, Red Cross has just a tremendous amount of volunteers that all want to do di digital humanitarian work now and it's, it's a really great way to volunteer. Um, so everyone's happy that way. We also have corporate partnerships, and a lot of people ask us how these partnerships work. And the really cool thing about Missing Maps is that it's really organic, so we can grow in different areas. Um, but it also allows for different types of partnerships, so you can be really dynamic in the types of people that you work with. Um, JP Morgan Chase um, was one of our partners, and we've been working with them. They've so far had about 10 mapathons. And they full on just take a, an event space in their building. So they have between 100 and 200 people, set up computers, have a really cool mapping party. Um, and they love this because it's a great engagement tool for their corporation as well. So it's a great way to bring employees together and have like a social aspect and, and while they're doing something good as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's really fun. Um, other ways we get partnerships is through donations. So Cisco um, helped us with the donation that helped us fund a gamification page and the user profile. So if you go to the Missing Maps website, you can take a look at that. Um, basically, we had a lot of people at remote mapathons trying to figure out, you know, how they're doing compared to everybody else. And you know, when you gamify something, it's it's everyone jumps on board, it's engaging. Um, a disaster is great to get volunteers, but what do you do in between, right? Like, how do you get people to come? Um, pizza's going to take you only so far. So this was a, another tool that basically can help people keep track of what they're doing. 
Um, and this is uh, Daniels, who's on the Red Cross team. We took his page. He has some really cool statistics, too. Um, and you also get cool badges. So as you're going through, there's really fun badges. So you can get a field mapper for mapping in remote fields or um, on the road again for mapping a certain amount of roads. So you can, you can keep um, going. And the other cool tool is that you can make a competitive feature on one of the user boards. Um, I don't have my computer plugged in, so I'll just tell you about it, but you can check it out. So you can have different hashtags um, through the tasking manager and basically use that to have competition. So if it's two different teams within the same company or different chapters in different states, you can put the right hashtags in the tasking manager and pull up those stats live. So as you're having a mapathon, you could like have some really cool training around that. Um, this is another partnership. It's with Accenture, and this was through the Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, um, in London. And one of the volunteers from the British Red Cross went to this and happened to work for Accenture and went back and told their company about it, and they super loved it to a point where they started creating their own training material to help with their employees, and that's where we started our first videos. Um, they ended up having, within a couple of months, a mapathon for 900 people. Um, and just very recently did their own, like completely planned by themselves, 700, map, 700 people mapathon in over 40 cities. Um, so the, the, the reason for most of the success in Missing Maps is these community leaders that emerge. So people that come through that feel very passionate about it and given the right tools, they can go on and basically create their, you know, their own mapathons in their own communities um, and, and they have the leeway to do that, which is really exciting. Um, so community mapping, which is the mapping we do in the field, is a little bit different. Um, it's a little more challenging, so it's, it, it's not something you can do completely remotely, like the remote mapping and, you know, put instructions on a website and have people watch videos. It's very hands-on. It also starts well in advance, so if we go on a two-week trip, we're planning for about three months, because you have to think about logistics, um, you know, security, being in another country, um, you know, what are your technical capacity um, in that country? Um, it's, it's, we've, we've been to, I want to say, nine countries now. Um, and, you know, each time it's very new and exciting and we keep getting better because we learn new things and we're also trying out new technology um, as we create it because OSM is really great and collecting data in the U.S. or Europe or anywhere we have Wi-Fi and cellular data, it's really awesome. But what do you do in a village, right? where there's no power and there's no water? Um, and how do you upload that data at the end of the day or check it without access to all these tools? So recently, um, one example is of how we create partnerships um, with community mapping. There was a fire sensor project in a slum area called Kailicha, which is a really, really big area. Um, it's a couple, let me see. Um, I had it written down, yeah, 400,000 people um, live in this. So it's like 16 square miles, so think about it. It's like half a city in most places. Um, and this is all you see for miles, is just shacks. And through a lot of local intervention, um, they figured out there was, uh, the biggest problem was fires. And so they got a local organization that was working in that group that already had uh, relationships with them, a local group that made fire senses and figured out how to work in that area as well and worked with the Red Cross, and we went out there to map. Um, so in addition to us reaching out to local universities, the Red Cross volunteers, to see if there was anyone doing OSM, we also worked with those local groups so that when we did the training, everyone basically got trained, and now you're leaving with um, building some capacity and equipment so that they can continue mapping. Um, and these are just kind of some of the pictures of um, what takes place. You can see we're, they're mapping with um, field papers over there and we use Garmin GPSs because it was too dangerous to take cell phones. Um, just some really uh, great pictures. This was actually one of the community uh, meetings that they have. Um, through the Red Cross, whenever they're doing projects, they do a lot of community meetings to engage with the community, let them know if you're going to have 40 people running around your city or your town, you kind of want to know what they're doing, especially if they're in front of your house, like taking down your information. So it's very important to spend a lot of time um, engaging with that community, even local government, even letting the police know that you're there, um, but also training the local people because they get so excited 
um, when you like show them imagery of where they live and they can like pinpoint it. It's just, it's super exciting. Um, when we went to Colombia recently, one of our volunteers went home during a training and uh, basically mapped out his entire city and the roads all the way up to um, the, the city he was coming from. And that was like in a couple of hours, which was super exciting. Um, in Ecuador, something very similar. Um, what was really cool in Ecuador was, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of volunteers, but they were from all over the country. So they came from different places, which was something different. We tried, um, usually they're all from the same place because they know the community better. Um, it was really cool. A week later, they had an earthquake, and um, they were able to use the volunteers to help with disaster response because they were all trained in mobile data collection. Um, and they had the phones that we had just left the week before, which sped things up really quickly with recovery. So, um, you know, even though it's just mapping and we think of OSM, like this community expands a lot more and can make a huge difference in places. Um, and this is a picture of where the uh, center was for emergency response. Uh, something very similar in Dhaka, through uh, the Missing Maps um, British Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders group, they went in to train a couple of people and like create the first group of um, OSM people in Dhaka. And after that, multiple organizations have gone in there, um, like the World Bank, and I think Save the Children were there as well, using the same community and expanding to a point where now they have 100 plus volunteers that are super good at OSM and can collect data um, and help with a lot of things. So our last thing was basically, we have some really cool lessons learned, which we keep learning on all of our projects, because it's new and no, not very many people have done this before. Um, but one of my favorites was a story, and that's basically that one experience describes lessons learned we've, that lessons that we've learned all across. Um, we had a kids mapathon for Take Your Kids to Work Day at J.P. Morgan Chase um, a couple of months ago, and we started off with maybe 25 kids, so that, and then eventually they were 400. Um, so that, as you can imagine, is quite challenging to, to try and figure out how you're going to keep an attention of a seven-year-old for, you know, a little time and have them map really quality data. But we reached out to a couple of people that have done it before, and we've got some really good lessons for what worked and what didn't work, and we're able to prep for it. So, um, you know, not much craziness ended up happening, luckily. Um, so it was just a matter of communication and reaching out. The other thing that we advise is to take risks. Just because no one else has done it before doesn't mean you shouldn't. Um, it may seem like a crazy thing to the community, but if you give it a try and you, you know, try as much as possible to avert any issues, you, you could learn quite a bit and have a really good time. Um, the other thing is feedback. So whether it's a five-year-old trying to go on OSM with their parents or, you know, a 60-year-old or a 90-year-old, there's so much to learn from people. So if you just keep listening to what people are saying and you know, each time you improve a little bit better, um, we can all come to a really good place. Um, the, the other one was creating a self-sustaining model. So it's obviously not practical um, with everybody working to go out and do this like you know, seven days a week. Um, but if you can create community leaders, you can reach a lot more people. Um, lots of people want to help and work with disasters and volunteer. It's just a really innate human quality and I think everyone wants to do it, but giving them the tools to be able to go out and do that and create a community um, is what drives things forward. So we had a lot of train the trainer sessions and we do that with our corporate partners as well, which is really helpful. Um, and the last one is finding your way to yes. Like, don't uh, always take no as an, on, uh, as an answer, um, not to be obstinate, but if, there, if someone is saying something can't be done, like, find a way. I mean, I bought cupcakes for our IT team for us to finally get Wi-Fi, and they opened up the ceilings to show me routers, but, you know, there is a way, um, so just look for it. Um, so that's it's pretty much about missing maps. Uh, the Red Cross group is all here, and, and Dale will be giving a keynote tomorrow, so you'll get a lot more information, um, and you can always chat with them individually. And they are hiring, so if you guys want a job or you know some people that are looking, um, chat with one of the Red Cross people. Cool. Thank you guys so much.
questions for our speaker, please raise your hand. Thank you, uh, Alo. In 2020, uh, in Africa, in third world country, more people will be very excited to ask you to web mapping, how to use web mapping. Uh, if they get improved technology in third world country, India, Africa, and South America, people have to ask it. I speak web mapping. Web mapping? Yeah, so that, that's a very common thing for us, and that's great. And we'd love for it to get to that place, uh, for people to be uh, able to have uh, web mapping options. Um, but right now, the places that the Red Cross is working, they're very rural, so they don't really have access to internet most of the time power. So we're, we're kind of using a paper method, but also showing that, that you know, they, they, they learn how to use OSM and JOSM, actually, so they, they can see it. But we hope to one day get to the web mapping stage. Hello, loved your presentation, gave me some ideas for Wikipedia community building, so thank you. Um, I'm curious, why are you using OpenStreetMap as opposed to some of the other mapping tools that you could be using for some of this type of work? I'm, I'm not deep into maps and the technical world of maps, so I'm just kind of curious why you choose this particular tool to do the kind of work that you're doing for American Red Cross. Cool, so I am not the tech expert, but I'm gonna give you my best answer, so feel free to change it. But OpenStreetMap, from what we found, was the most open uh, platform that we could use, but also reaching other people. There was a lot of training material on how to use it. It's fairly easy, it's fairly simple. People feel like they have ownership on the data, which is really nice, and it's also a very neat community um, to get involved with, and it like aligns with humanitarian purposes really well. Hi, uh, I noticed you uh, worked a lot in informal settlements and informal communities, and I'm just wondering how you deal with the um, reality that sometimes it's not fresh. I mean, that changes often. So uh, how do you know when your maps are really out of date, and do you also do any work in uh, crisis settings, like refugee camps or something like that, where actually that's probably even a bigger problem? Thanks. That's a really great question. So that's completely true, though. And settlements, like basically if there's a fire or a natural disaster, these metal houses, which are basically five pieces of metal, will come down right away and within two days they'll build another one. So it is very transient. Um, and we do understand that when we're doing projects, we always align our mapping, community mapping, with a project that's taking place. Um, and so we've worked out the timeline and that's why we train the local community to be able to do it and so they can do that upkeep. So once they know, and we leave, we always leave equipment behind. So that's the, the mobile phones. Um, and computers, and a lot of it's open and free, all of it's open and free that we use, and so it's not hard for them to access. So once that community is trained, and there's usually like 40 people between university students, they can go back and change that. Um, and then the second question was, disaster response, yes. Um, so in a disaster response setting, we don't do a lot of local mapping, obviously, because it's more, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's going on on the ground, and the, the people in that country are obviously busy. There's a lot of remote mapping that happens, which is a big thing in humanitarian um, open street maps. So if you look at the tasking manager, a lot of different organizations will put stuff up, even the disasters that don't show up on media, like the small scale ones will show up where people are helping, and they have people all around the world that help coordinate these efforts, so you can do a lot of remote mapping and go in, put roads and buildings in, so they can at least sometimes even see that there's people that exist there. And Christy, we yep. have one last question for you. Sure. Quick. A couple slides back, you mentioned that it was too dangerous to have the cell phones, and you were using Garmin GPS. What, what was dangerous about those cell phones? Um, so a lot of these, Areas are really poverty stricken areas. So if you walk around with cell phones, um, you know, you're more likely to get mugged because it's a really easy thing to sell in other countries. But we also like go in groups to avoid any of those situations and we have community leaders and stuff, but it's always better for us to take precautions. Um, and if the volunteers don't feel safe, we find another way. Cool. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you.